Good evening and welcome to our first webinar that has been organized by Discovery and Sama. This is a series of audiovisual uh, sessions that we're planning to bring to you uh, to equip you with some of the latest clinical insights and updates on COVID-19. Today we've got a list of, we've got a lineup of amazing speakers who are experts in the field of epidemiology and in the management of these virological infections. Uh, my name is Dr. Nolutando Nematswarani. I'm the head for Center for Clinical Excellence at Discovery, and I'll be moderating the session. We've got four speakers um, that are going to deliver presentations this evening. And I'm going to give you a brief uh, you know, uh, overview of who they are and what topic they're going to be covering. What we're going to do this evening is to try and make sure that there are no interruptions in between the, the presentations. We'll allow the, the sessions to go through. At the end of this session, we will allow a 20 minute, um, we'll allocate a 20 minute slot where people can actually engage in, in a, a question and answer session. During this uh, session, uh, there is a button uh, for Q&A. Please submit your questions. We will collate and consolidate these um, questions and put them in themes so that we can effectively manage uh, these uh, with the panelists in the allocated time. Should we not be able to cover all the questions that have been submitted, please uh, be assured that we will, um, you know, make uh, arrangements for these questions to be, uh, you know, to be answered at a later stage. We are hoping that this is the first of many webinars that we are going to be, uh, you know, uh, scheduling for, for, for the clinicians to make sure that you are equipped with the latest updated information. We are all aware that uh, you know, information is changing every day. We need to make sure that the clinicians are, are getting the latest and updated information. Um, we also have our content hub at Discovery that provides you with some of the resources. Um, we also would like to encourage you to use the NICD website and also the government website for additional information relating uh, to COVID-19. Just now, I'm going to then, uh, you know, give you an, um, you know, uh, a list of the, the presenters, their names, who they are, and also what topics that uh, they will be covering. Up first is going to be Dr. Kim Robeck, uh, who's going to be discussing the clinical management of COVID-19, followed by Professor Lucille Bloomberg, who is the Deputy Director of NICD. She's going to be discussing, um, you know, a topic around testing, who needs to be tested, what tests need to be used. And, and I think this is an important topic for all of us. Followed by Professor Adrian Doucet, who's going to really be sharing some, some useful insights on how clinicians could protect themselves um, you know, from contracting COVID-19. At the end, we'll have uh, Dr. Elinda Erasmus, who also works uh, for the NICD, who will be talking mainly around contact tracing you know, and, and also management of contacts in terms of quarantine. We will then allow uh, Dr. Kim to kick us off with her presentation on the clinical management of COVID-19. I hope you enjoy this, uh, the session and please remember to, to uh, share your questions on the Q&A button there and we will make sure that at the end of the session we have your questions collated and consolidated for us to uh, get uh, our panelists to, uh, to respond to them. Over to you, Kim. Thank you, Nolu Tando, and thank you very much to everybody for arranging this fantastic webinar, and to everybody who's spending a, an hour of their evening listening to this. Welcome, and we hope that it's really going to be very interesting and thought-provoking. So I'm going to start by telling you about the clinical manifestations of COVID-19 and some of the clinical details. This has been aimed mainly at general practitioners, but I'd certainly be happy to have a discussion perhaps afterwards or privately with people if you feel that you'd like to know something about the in-hospital management and potentially from a specialist point of view. So first of all, let's talk about the incubation period of this infection. There's been, in a matter of three months, so many extra uh, articles, journal articles, so much information has poured into us. And I don't think any disease 
has been made such a huge extent to try and understand it as what we have with COVID-19. We already know that the incubation period is really very short. It's between five and six days. And we also know that most cases are mild. So more than 80% of cases are mild and patients will usually present with nonspecific flu-like symptoms. The majority of people complain that they've got a fever and a dry cough. Now, it's rare for patients to have runny noses, to sneeze, to have sore throats. And these are some of the things which we'll see a little bit later in the presentation may help us to distinguish between the usual kind of upper respiratory tract and respiratory tract infections that we are expecting to start as the winter gets more and more into it. Um, beg your pardon. So uh, after about seven days, this is when patients may potentially um, deteriorate. The viral mnemonic stage starts. And some of these patients, not many, less than 20% may require admission as they start feeling short of breath um, and start deteriorating. So the clinical features um, were really well described in this article published in the CDC Chinese Journal of Epidemiology at the beginning of the year. And they looked at 72,000 cases of COVID-19 in China and described the typical presentation and how many people uh, get mild, severe, and critically ill patients um, through the infection. And here we see the 81% which have mild infections, flu-like, nonspecific, and recover and stay at home. 14% of them may go on to develop the second stage, which is the pulmonary stage, means more severe infection, probably need to be admitted. Around 5% of them may be critical, need respiratory and extra support, may go on to develop multi-organ failure. And initially, the Chinese reported a case fatality and mortality rate of around 2%. We know now over the last couple of months, with um, areas like Italy, France, and the USA having actually got higher case fatality rates, and in some regions reporting 5% and even up to 10%, although this is not, not the norm. So let's talk a little bit about the differential diagnosis, because as we said, it's really, really difficult when somebody presents with such nonspecific upper respiratory tract signs sort of very vague, um, and how are we going to work out who needs to be tested for COVID-19 and who has just got ordinary run-of-the-mill enterovirus or whatever's flo going to float around this year. So it's important to know that in the South African winter, we're going to expect all kinds of other viral infections, including influenza. Um, and it's often helpful to understand and get some insight into what is floating around in this season. So last year, we had a lot of rhinovirus and enterovirus. And as the winter progresses, I'm sure we'll get some insight into what the other viral infections are. But Again, the Chinese published in the beginning of the year in Lancet and tried to give us some idea of the kind of presenting symptoms that patients did. Over 80% presented with a fever and a cough. It's a dry cough. It's not a productive cough. So that helps one to distinguish between things. Often, although the patient may not have a fever at presentation, this may develop a little bit later. So we say 83% for fever and cough, but it may not be on day one that they have the fever. Uh, uh, quite a significant major, um, percentage of people may experience shortness of breath, but again, that's usually after seven days when they may deteriorate. Then the rest of the things on this table over here, myalgia, confusion, headache, sore throat, runny nose, chest pain, and gastrointestinal symptoms are very, very, very um, unusual compared to fever, cough, and dyspnea. So if your patient's main complaint is a sore throat or rhinorrhea, which is extremely common, this might be a clue that it's not COVID-19 and would make a person feel that it's probably one of the other viral um, infections. Now, we've seen in the recent weeks increasing reports of anosmia and ajusia. So patients reporting that they're not able to smell and that they're not able to taste. This is really quite a recent um, symptom, 
and seems to be as high as 20%, maybe even higher, being first reported by the French and the Italians. And I'm sure we're going to see more and more of these reports coming out. And it seems to be that the virus causes direct damage to the olfactory and gustatory receptors, rather than having, for instance, a blocked nose and not being able to smell because of that. This is not the case with COVID-19. A TARCS team has been set up and the GC chemosensory group is going to investigate this and hopefully we'll have better understanding as to percentage of patients that present with this as well as um, why. So another interesting thing is if your patient has very mild symptoms, so really not much, uh, maybe a little bit of a fever once and not, not again, or they've got something strange upper respiratory tract wise, ask them if they can still smell things and if they're able to taste things. And if they're not able to, that might be an early warning sign that this could be COVID-19. So what do we expect on the chest x-ray of our patients? Usually in the first stage, which is the first week, patient's chest x-ray is normal. Um, as time progresses, though, the majority of people will have infiltrates on the chest x-ray. And if you are hospitalized, over 70% will have changes early on. The changes are usually bilateral, they're peripheral, they're more in the lower zones than the upper zones, and they ground glass in keeping with the typical features that one would expect with a viral pneumonia. In terms of blood tests, the full blood count is often normal apart from a low lymphocyte count, so they have a lymphopenia. The CRP is usually only very slightly elevated, so 10, 15, 20, not usually more than 20, might even still be normal in the early stages. And abnormal blood results only start manifesting in the late stages of the disease. And in this case, one sees markers of inflammation, such as suddenly from a normal or slightly elevated CRP to a massively elevated CRP, procalcitonins can go up, ferritins, D-dimers, LDH, pro-BNPs, etc. because in these stages, there may be a massive inflammatory response and one can even have a myocarditis. So although we're not going to discuss all of this in this presentation, because we're trying to focus mainly on stage one and the kind of stage that the general practitioner would see, this is really a nice slide to explain the clinical manifestations of COVID as a three-stage disease, stage one being the viral replication stage, stage two being the pulmonary phase where patients present with viral pneumonia. In the beginning, they are not hypoxic. Later on, they become hypoxic. And then a very small percentage of these pulmonary phases, less than 5%, will go on to stage three, which is a hyperinflammatory state, bonanza of cytokines, immune stimulation, and really where the mortality comes from in COVID-19, because this is where patients develop ARDS, SIRS, may become shocked and even go into cardiac failure. So we are focusing on stage one, and I just want to have a few slides on who can be managed at home and how to manage these patients at home. So there are criteria, which means that they, it's going to be safe to manage your patients at home. And this are the following criteria in people who are over the age of 12. If your patient sats are more than 95%, their respiratory rate is less than 25, they have a heart rate that is under 120 beats per minute, a temperature between 36 and 39 degrees, and have a normal mental status that it is safe to manage those patients at home. If you are dealing with children between the ages of 5 and 12, remember that one would accept a heart rate under 130 and a respiratory rate of under 30. So if you manage your patients at home, what does it mean? So any person with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 needs to be isolated. That means that they should preferably stay in a separate room away from the rest of the family with the door closed and if the weather permits, to have open windows to get good airflow in the room. If it's possible, they should use a separate bathroom to the rest of the family and should also use different crockery and cutlery to eat with. 
Now, obviously, especially in South Africa, it's not always the case that we've got extra rooms and especially extra bathrooms. So if contact with other house occupants is unavoidable, then the patient should be asked to wear a surgical mask when they're in contact with other house occupants and at all times to try and keep a distance of at least one meter, but two meters distance being preferable. Um, so ideally, if people are not able to stay in a separate room again, just remind your patients that if possible, they shouldn't sleep in the same bed as other family members, and they should also avoid any physical contact, kissing and hugging, etc. Now, in the first stage, the viral replication stage, mild symptoms, the only management that is necessary for the patient is to have paracetamol if they have a fever or feel unwell. Remember that it's one thing to ask somebody to go and stay at home, but it's really important for them to understand what being at home means and also that we follow up with them and make sure that they're still okay. So regular checkups with email or telephone is very important and they must know who to contact if they deteriorate and how to get hold of somebody if they feel that they're unwell. It's often very difficult to assess somebody who's at home to try and decide whether they are really deteriorating or if they're feeling anxious. So how is it, what kind of scores can one use to make a decision about whether to bring a patient in or not? Most of you are familiar with the MRC Disney scale, which gives an idea of the degree of breathlessness depending on the kind of physical activity that your patient's doing. So ask them on the phone, when do you feel short of breath? Is it when you walk up an incline or when you walk up the stairs in your house? Is it when you walk to your bathroom on a flat level? Or is it simply when you're sitting on the edge of the bed and changing your clothes? One can get a good idea of the score and also know and compare when you'd speak to them two days later if things have changed. Another interesting thing to look at is the Roth score, which is really fascinating. And I would um, suggest that if you haven't heard of it, you Google it and read up some more information. But it's basically a way of asking the patient to hold their breath and then to start counting. And depending on what number they get to, gives us an idea of what their room air sats are. So for instance, if you look at the top of the table, if they can only get to seven counting with their breath held, there's a 100% sensitivity that their room air sats are under 95% and 87% sensitivity that their room air sats are under 90%. And again, as one compares it with different phone calls, one can get a good idea of deterioration. When does deterioration happen? Usually in the 20% who may deteriorate, this happens around day seven or day eight. They start complaining of shortness of breath, get a worsening cough, might have a persistent fever, and these patients need to um, be arranged preferably directly with an admission to a local hospital with the physician that you normally contact, and please do not just arrive in the emergency department or at the front door of the hospital where they can um, potentially infect other people. Also, if possible, ask your patient to wear a mask when they arrive uh, for admission. What happens if your patient feels better and after seven days, really 80% of people should definitely start feeling better? People can de-isolate themselves after 14 days. It is not necessary to repeat the COVID-19 PCR, and we do not need to document a negative PCR before patients are de-isolated. Lots of questions we have about us. Does it mean I'm immune? We think it does. We don't know for how long. So you'll be presumed immune for this season and hopefully won't get COVID-19 again, although there have been case reports of reinfection. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention, and I'll look forward to your questions afterwards. Prof Duse, thank you. Great. I assume you can all hear me, and good evening, and thank you for attending the seminar. So I'm looking at the infection prevention control aspects and giving some advice of what the GP could do with COVID-19. The first important point to remember is that this is a potentially uh, disruptive disease for a practice. It creates a huge amount of panic. So business cannot be done as usual. Wherever possible, avoid unnecessary face-to-face -face consultations. Give patients, for example, repeat prescriptions in advance. And to decrease the burden of respiratory infection and panic, make sure that your patients and you are immunized against influenza. 
Wherever possible, a lot of consultations can be done remotely, either telephonically through SMS, email, or if you have the facility telemedicine. But for essential face-to-face -face consultations, and it's important that you do this on the basis of triage, you may decide that on the basis of, of a triage that is done telephonically or online, you might want to go to the patient's home rather than have the patient come to you. So you've already heard about the cardinal symptoms of COVID, and um, what is really critical is that you always follow the case definition of the NICD of COVID-19, because it's quite um, important that you really get a feel of what is required for you to make a, a guess on the side that it's most likely going to be COVID. So inquire orders about possible exposures. Severe pneumonias must actually be investigated. And patients who have got just symptoms of fever, cough, and shortness of breath, and a suggestive exposure history, um, you could do a home consultation on rather than having them come into your own practice. Uh, but patients who are showing signs of trouble, and you've heard these already from Dr. Oberg, um, such as dyspnea, pain, constriction of the chest, confusion, etc., should rather actually be admitted uh, directly to a um, emergency center or a hospital. I just want to remind you that if you do face-to-face -face consultations in your practice, it is critical that you remember that you're bound by the Occupational Health and Safety Act and its associated regulations to do a risk assessment of your own workplace and also screen and assess where you're going to put your various members of staff should they be at high risk because they're elderly or they've got some underlying condition uh, for COVID severe disease. Staff are entitled to a safe environment and that means that you have to provide them with all the necessary IPC provisions by law. It really is important to try and avoid walking appointments. With online appointments, you can have an accompanying triage questionnaire that the patient can fill in and even actually get details of patient risk factors. Um, and telephonic bookings could also actually uh, deliver a triage questionnaire. Once you have, in fact, patients that come in and you decide that you want to see them in your practice, you need to organize appointments into cohorts. So those that are most likely to be um, respiratory infection, do that cluster separately from those that have got other conditions that are not even going to be remotely COVID related. Space out appointments, please, uh, so that you only have one patient wherever possible in the reception and orders maintained if uh, at one to 1.5 meter distance between people. Patients with a cough or a sneeze uh, could be given a surgical mask prior to entry once you are expecting them at a specific time, um, and that is pretty important. So an example of an online booking pathway could look something like this. The patient goes online, books an appointment, uh, has in fact then a telephonic consultation where you do a triaging process and you ask uh, the patient about possible high risk uh, conditions that you may worry about should there be persuasive potential COVID people. The healthcare professional does the triage telephonically during this kind of appointment and if the patient is relatively well um, then the patient can be managed remotely. Um, if the patient actually requires a face-to-face -face consultation that patient may be brought in. Signage for COVID disease is always helpful. For example, it must be accompanied by the appropriate tools, making sure that before people enter the reception area, um, there is a hand hygiene station outside the door prior to entry, um, and also uh, have availability of surgical masks so that if they're coughing and uh, sneezing, uh, sorry, coughing and feverish patients that have been seen um, uh, on the triage online or telephonically to be a potential COVID case, make sure that they wear a surgical mask prior to entry into the room. For all face-to-face -face consultations, in the absence of a vaccine, in the absence of antiviral treatment, the only thing that is there to protect is infection prevention control. And for that, we need to really look very quickly at transmission mechanisms. So COVID-19 is spread predominantly by respiratory droplets. A proportion of cases are, are required following contact with contaminated hands, touching surfaces that then uh, go to the face and uh, inoculate virus into areas such as the eyes, the nose and the mouth. Processes in, that uh, cause mechanical aerosolization are potentially a problem um, and so they, uh, they are very definitely a problem, a bigger pardon. So nebulization, um, intubation, etc. Um, are, are really definitely high-risk events, and these patients need uh, uh, to be 
uh, deep, need to be dealt with some slightly different PPE that will come to. And there is a, a, a concern that certain, um, probably very little transmission occurs on the fecal oral route. So contact transmission is really touching. If a patient has got respiratory secretions, contaminating environmental surfaces, or in fact, uh, the doctor or any of his paraphernalia like stethoscopes, uh, these organisms can persist on these contaminated surfaces for periods of time, from hours to days. Um, when you then touch your face, you're basically bringing virus into areas that are highly vulnerable and infection can occur. I'm sure that as I'm giving this talk, most of you are scratching your head or uh, scratching your beard if you have one. Um, just remember that touching the face is an involuntary, very common habit and it's exceptionally difficult to stop doing it. So uh, perform high and hygiene as frequently as possible so that when you do touch your face inadvertently, um, you will more likely touch it with a clean hand. Now, oropharyngeal respiratory transmission uh, is really um, very important in understanding COVID disease. When people talk or um, sing or cough or sneeze, uh, droplets are generated and expectorate in an aerosol that is created. Large droplets generally uh, tend to drop to the ground or on surfaces, and they take some time to evaporate. Whereas, in fact, the smaller droplets on the top part of the aerosol plume that you see there um, tend to dry out pretty quickly and remain suspended in air. If there's virus on these droplets, then obviously in fact transmission may occur. Respiratory droplet transmission, the large droplets are shed for between one to one and a half meters, um, are the ones that are predominant of concern in COVID-19 infection. So prevention risk reduction stands uh, really as a, in the area of simple infection prevention control. First, remember that it is your duty to always apply standard precautions uh, because they underpin all practices. And this means that every patient must be considered infectious all of the time, um, which means that uh, certain processes such as hand hygiene, decision on risk assessment to use gloves or PPE, safe disposal of sharps, um, getting rid of waste properly, safe handling of linen and environmental cleaning are all important. For contact transmission, the items that you need for infection prevention are a hand washing station, uh, such as a basin with soap and water and paper towel, hand sanitizer, gloves, a disposable plastic apron, um, and a, a surgical mask. If there's aerosolization occurring, then an N95 respirator will be required. And protection of the eyes um, and face through uh, goggles or a visor or some kind of shield is important. So hand hygiene can be practiced in two ways, by using ordinary soap and water. Please remember to remove jewelry. Do not wear jewelry um, when you are in a practice, particularly during epidemics, because you want to wash your hands exceptionally well. And you should be doing this all the time. Um, make sure that you wet your hands, you lather them, and you cover all the surfaces as is indicated in the pictures on this particular slide that will be given to you at the end of the talk. And wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. Hand sanitization um, does not replace hand washing if your hands are visibly soiled. It can only be done if your hands are clean. Um, and this is using a hand sanitizer, which often contains alcohol, but you get non-alcohol based formulations as well. Um, and the duration of the procedure for hand sanitizing is in the region of about 20 to 30 seconds, although 15 seconds in studies that have been done seem to be sufficient, particularly if alcohols are used. Alcohol solutions must be at concentrations of between 60 and 80 percent um, as are more effective at these um, concentrations. Pure alcohol is generally not advocated and not effective. And please remember when you go out and buy sanitizer that um, if you want to stop getting coronavirus, you need other people to wash their hands too. So be moderate in the amount of stuff that you order in so that people have got accessible ability to these things. Often in contact transmission, um, is the decision is important to wear gloves. Gloves are not a substitute for hand washing by any means. And when they're removed, and there's a specific sequence of the removal, hands must be washed thereafter. And a disposable plastic apron, which you see in the slide number one, um, is important. It's cheap and it provides frontal contact protection against organisms. I will be giving a little video clip of the sequence of how to remove a glove safely to discovery, and this will be circulated with the slides and the material. For droplet transmission, the items that you need is a surgical mask, 
and only for procedure traits mechanical aerosols and N95 respirator, um, as well as goggles or a visor. So it's everything that's for contact transmission plus those additional items. And we've already said that COVID-19 is spread by, droplet, um, by droplets and organisms that are similarly spread are listed in that slide. Precautions um, that you can use in your practice ensure good ventilation, open windows. Um, if your mechanical ventilation is not working um, are very important and a good idea. Wearing a standard surgical mask for single use and working within one to two meters of the patient and goggles or visors. The do's and don'ts of medical masks are very clear. Put it on properly, use it only once. Don't touch and readjust the mask. Uh, make sure that there's no gap between the mask and the face so that you've got a reasonable seal. Um, and discard uh, masks properly after use. Do not have them dangling under your nares or around your neck. That mask is useless and will contaminate other areas of your body. Mechanical aerosol transmission. Uh, the items needed for infection prevention is basically that the apron is replaced by a surgical gown and the mask is replaced by an N95 respirator um, and goggles and visors stand. There are certain criteria that you'd look for for an N95 respirator. It is not a simple mask and these criteria um, should be listed on a product for you to have suitable reassurance that it's a good quality product and it is approved. Surgical masks, um, it was previously thought it was not necessary to wear in public places. Um, it's still not advocated by the WHO if people are asymptomatic, but certain countries insist on this happening. It is necessary for healthcare workers, however, uh, when they're applying droplet precautions, and it is necessary to put on a patient who might actually be um, symptomatic and coughing and spluttering to really reduce and create a barrier against those respiratory secretions. Um, N95 respirator, please only use during cough inducing or aerosol generating procedures or intubations because those are important. This chart is nifty. It's there for you to use and it just shows you what reception staff should be wearing and looking at various categories of healthcare workers that may or may not be in the practice and procedures that they might or might not use. Receptionists mainly hand hygiene and distance and so it becomes more complex as it goes down. The donning and doffing of PPE, the sequence is more or less um, as you see it there. Um, you can use it in any way. Uh, gloves are put on last, and because hands are the dirtiest, the gloved ha hands are the first that need to be attended to when you doff. In other words, you remove them first, and then um, you go through the sequence shown. I'm not going to go into any details on environmental cleaning. There are universal wipes, there's chlorine that can be diluted. You can buy ordinary jick. And here we show you how to dilute it to appropriate concentrations. And any paraphernalia that you're using, like visors, goggles that you want to reuse, can be washed with soap and water, followed by a 70% alcohol wipe. And that should suffice in your practice. So COVID guidance for people is driving everybody stark raving bonkers. And the British government admits this as well. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll take questions later. Thank you so much, Prof. Duse. We're going to try and get uh, Prof. Bloomberg to um, share his slides. Lucille? So who should be tested? Um, as we have moved into community transmission, the indications for uh, the criteria for uh, laboratory investigation have changed. And we've moved away from travelers with respiratory symptoms. Um, because there's very little travel and we now have uh, community spread. We need to prioritize those because there are uh, limited kits. Uh, I think we're being overwhelmed with testing of the worried well, and we need to identify specific patients at particular risk in their settings. So patients with pneumonia who are hospitalized should be tested for COVID-19. Healthcare workers and related with respiratory symptoms uh, should be tested. Persons with acute respiratory illness uh, with sudden onset of at least uh, one of the following, and I think Kim has mentioned those, uh, should be tested. And then symptomatic contacts of positive cases or PUIs in the previous 14 days should be tested. Asymptomatic contacts should not routinely be tested. And now there is a new program of community 
door-to-door -door screening and testing to uh, try and identify cases in vulnerable communities who up to now have not been uh, part of actually any testing to date. So um, if you can move the, the slide to the next one. Thank you. Not quite sure why this is not working. There we go. I think these are some of the challenges we're facing at the moment. There is over-testing of the worried well, uh, over-testing of people in certain areas, and very much under-testing in more rural areas and more vulnerable communities. And it's likely that we are missing a number of cases. Next slide. So how do we collect the specimens? Well, they um, are naso oropharyngeal swabs. Uh, we do two swabs. They go into the same specimen uh, collection uh, container. Um, and they should be transmitted to the laboratory as soon as possible using a cold chain. It's very important to use the appropriate swabs um, to make sure that there's no inhibition um, of the PCR testing and the details are on the websites. And there are accompanying forms that need to, to go with the specimens. If the patients have pneumonia, then lower respiratory tract infections using various samples um, should be used. And it's important, as Adrian has highlighted, not to perform sputum induction. Next one. So the test of choice is a molecular test. It is a PCR test, a polymerase chain reaction. It's highly sensitive and specific for the virus that causes COVID-19. There are two different types. The one is the conventional PCR that is done in a laboratory. The second is the gene expert that has recently been introduced. It is a rapid test, it takes an hour. It's a, what we would call a near patient test. And I think many people would be more familiar with gene expert used for TB. The tests um, may be negative initially and should be repeated if COVID-19 is highly likely. And it's important that a good quality specimen is provided, otherwise you may get a negative result. I think our focus is on COVID-19. I think people need to consider the differential diagnosis of fever. Many of you are working in malaria transmission areas. Please do not forget malaria and the occurrence of other respiratory infections, particularly as we move towards the influenza season. Next one. The one test that absolutely should not be done, and I, I really couldn't make the no big enough, are what we call the serological tests, which seem to be widely available, are being offered to general practitioners as rapid tests, point of care tests. They are cheap, they are easy to do, they identify IgG and IgM, but they should not be done. They have major problems with sensitivity, so they will likely be positive in the first week of illness, which is when you want to identify patients with COVID-19, both for management and for isolation to decrease transmission and identify contacts, and you're gonna have a false negative result. So these tests should not be used for the confirmation or exclusion of COVID-19, um, and they have no place in the acute diagnosis of our patients. I think one more. Um, I think Kim has mentioned that, uh, this de-isolation of COVID um, positive persons. Um, there is no need to do a repeat specimen. It's not good use of limited, um, of limited kits. And in fact, um, if it's positive, it simply won't differentiate between viable virus um, and in infectious patients versus the presence of RNA. And it's, it's, it's a time-based uh, de-isolation uh, of 14 days for mild cases after symptom onset. And I think that's, that's it. Thanks very much. So good evening, everyone, and thanks for having us. I'm just going to talk very briefly on contact tracing. Um, I think the most important thing is who is a close contact. Um, and we define that as a person who's had face-to-face -face contact with um, somebody who's been diagnosed with COVID. And that's less than one meter, less than or equal to one meter 
all has been in a closed space with the COVID-19 case for at least 15 minutes. And this includes, amongst others, all persons living in the same household as the COVID-19 case, and very often people who are working closely in the same environment as the case. Obviously, healthcare workers um, often fit this criteria. So healthcare workers or other person providing direct care for a COVID-19 case, but the proviso there is while not wearing the recommended personal protective equipment or PPE. Um, as you're all aware, our initial cases were primarily travel related. So we also had to consider contacts in an aircraft who were sitting within two seats in any direction of the case, travel companions or persons providing care, including the crew members serving in the section of the aircraft where the case was seated. Um, I just wanted to emphasize the necessity for completing a contact line list. And this should ideally be done when the patient's identified as a person under investigation. So don't wait until they test positive. As soon as you identify someone that you feel needs testing, you should already be filling in the contact list. Um, check with your local laboratories, because um, many of the laboratories are actually doing this at the time that they collect the specimen and you don't want to duplicate. The healthcare worker who collects the specimen is um, responsible for ensuring that these forms are completed. They can be emailed to um, this NICD address and as of tonight, there's also an electronic capturing system now available, a web link that can also be used and I will share those details with you. And then just to remind you that a confirmed case is someone who has a laboratory confirmation of SARS-CoV-2 infection using an RT-PCR assay, irrespective of the clinical signs and symptoms. And just to mention that symptomatic cases are considered infectious from two days before symptom onset to 14 days after symptom onset. So when you're doing the contact list, remember to start from two days before symptom onset. The contact line list um, was originally paper-based and you can use the paper-based and that is available on the NICD website. You can see that we need good details so that we're able to contact these people if the case, um, if your person under investigation tests positive. So it's surname, first name, sex, age, the relation to the case, the date of last contact, the place of last contact, the residential address of this contact for the next month, and a phone number. And we also ask whether they're a healthcare worker because obviously we need to be particularly careful of that group um, and their potential to spread disease. Um, how do we do contact tracing and monitoring of a close contact? So if your person are under investigation, if the laboratory testing confirms COVID-19 infection, then um, the contact tracing is done by the provincial CDCC or by the districts. And they have to contact the close contacts that you've mentioned on the list, or if there isn't a complete contact line list, they need to do one. Um, every contact needs to complete the contact demographic section on the contact monitoring form. And both those forms, as I mentioned, are available on the NICD website. Um, importantly, close contacts need to self-quarantine at home for 14 days since exposure to the confirmed case. And just to mention, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, that quarantine is separating asymptomatic individuals who've been potentially exposed to a disease from non-exposed ind individuals, as opposed to isolation of symptomatic cases. Um, the close contacts, while they're self-quarantining, they should be taking their temperatures twice daily and monitoring for symptoms. Um, depending on the province and the number of patients, the monitoring of these close contacts may be self-monitoring, or there may also be telephonic monitoring from a central source from the provincial CDC. Um, so here's the close contact monitoring tool which is also available on the website and gives um, the day and the, they check for fever, for chills, for cough, sore throat, shortness of breath, myalgia or body pains, 
and diarrhea and they've got a little form that they can complete or the person phoning them can complete for those 14 days. Um, and there's also a demographic section which gives um, details of the patient and the contact type, et cetera. Um, if a contact develops symptoms, then we need to let the provincial CDCC be um, no. Either the provincial CDCC or if they have contact with you, um, you need to organize for them to have a specimen collected on the same day to be tested for COVID-19. Then just to mention, um, because we do get queries about this, if the contact becomes asymptomatic but tests negative, it doesn't mean they can stop quarantining. They should remain in quarantine for that full 14 days. And if their symptoms persist or worsen, you may need to actually do repeat testing on that patient. For individuals who don't meet the definition of a close contact, but do have possible exposure, they should also be advised to contact a healthcare practitioner if they develop any symptoms within 14 since exposure. Um, the monitoring and, and the advice that we give to the contacts who have been asked to self-quarantine is fairly similar to what we ask for the isolated patients. They need to remain at home, can't go to work, can't go to school, can't go to public place areas, it's not the time to shop. They need to avoid unnecessary social contact, don't use public transport, don't travel, don't have visitors. Stay in a separate room away from other people if that's possible. If not, then just try and keep to one area and stay at least two meters away from other people. And then our usual precautions, cough etiquette, regular hand washing, separate bathroom if possible, or clean the bathroom after use. Avoid using the kitchen at the same time as others and don't share utensils. And there is actually um, a little leaflet for the public on the NICD website explaining about what to do if you're a close contact of a person with confirmed disease and need to home quarantine. Um, this is just um, showing you the summary of the contact tracing and really emphasizing that this can be a circular thing. So sometimes the person you screening as a contact actually develops symptoms and tests positive. They then become a case and then the whole cycle has to start again. You then need to look at their contacts and monitor their contacts in the same way. Um, and that was the last of my slides. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Erasmus. For those people who joined late, uh, I'd like to just uh, maybe give you um, a sense of which presentations we had. So we started our presentations with Dr. Kim Rob, uh, Robeck who is an infectious disease specialist working currently at Netcare Rosebank. Uh, she dealt with the clinical management of COVID-19. So we will be going into the question session and I will try and pose some of the questions that relate to her presentation. Uh, she was followed by Prof. Nuse, who is the head of clinical microbiology at VETS, also uh, you know, working at NICD. So he covered mainly uh, the protective, the, you know, the use of PPE, in the primary care setting. We've got some questions that we'll pose to him as well. And then followed by Prof. Uh, Lucille Bloomberg, who is uh, the Deputy Director at NICD. Um, so uh, she covered mainly the testing. The, there are quite a few questions coming uh, through for testing the appropriate tests and the combination of tests, um, and specifically the use of serology, which she touched on. And then the last um, you know, uh, presentation was uh, from Dr. Linda Erasmus who also works at NICD and she covered uh, contact tracing. So maybe for, for Kim, um, Kim, there, there are a few questions around the use of the Roth as a score uh, and its appropriateness in primary care setting. Uh, would you mind to, to address that? And I mean, some of the questions relate to some of the early symptoms, um, which I think you've already covered in your presentation. There may be some uh, presentations that are quite rare that uh, doctors may actually see uh, their patients presenting with, there was a comment around viral conjunctivitis, but most of the, of the other symptoms that uh, came through the questions were already covered in the presentation. Thanks, Nolotando. So yes, the Roth score is certainly not the easiest way to um, 
work out if somebody's deteriorating over the phone or not. However, it's one of the ways which may be useful. There's only two real hard ways, objective ways of, deteri of de measuring deterioration in a person who's not sitting in front of you, and that is a fever, in which case the patient needs to have their own thermometer to be able to do that, and second of all, to monitor their saturations. So we've been lucky in that some of our patients have had access to pulse oximeters and were able to do that. And one can clearly see then when the patient's deteriorating. But in the absence of a thermometer and a pulse oximeter, one needs to get a little bit creative to try and understand whether somebody is feeling anxious or is really deteriorating. So the Roth test is, is an example of something which may be used, but it has its limitations. And if you see on the chart which I put up, one can clearly see the sensitivity and specificity is not ideal with certain numbers. So yeah, I, I take that point. Just in terms of other manifestations, I saw in the comments and in the questions, people asking about conjunctivitis, asking about sore throats. So sore throat has never been one of the main um, sort of presenting symptoms for COVID-19. And one needs to consider the other viruses as well as bacteria, which can cause sore throats before thinking that it's COVID. It is part of the case definition um, for COVID-19, but any respiratory tract symptom is part of the case definition. In terms of conjunctivitis, almost any virus can cause a viral conjunctivitis, including COVID-19. It can cause a mild follicular conjunctivitis. Unfortunately, it is completely indistinguishable from other causes. So if your patient presents with conjunctivitis with fever and shortness of breath or a cough, then of course they should be tested. And one at the moment is going to have to have a low index of suspicion for asking people, even if you think that they don't necessarily have COVID, there's nothing wrong with asking your patients to isolate themselves for 14 days if you're not sure, and if you not, don't think you're going to be able to get a test result um, out of them. Um, Nolutando, I don't know, do you want me to answer some of the other questions, or I don't want to run out of time for the other people? Okay, let me allow Prof. Duse to also answer some of the questions. I think there's been quite a lot coming through around the recycling of surgical masks and respirators. And I think the one, one very interesting uh, question is coming from a doctor who is mainly in the rural environment where firstly the patients do not have access to virtual, virtual consults and therefore most of the consultations are face to face um, and uh, there is a shortage you know, of uh, PPE. So they just want some practical guidance as to how they can manage with this limited access to PPE. Right, if we just start with the issue of surgical masks. Um, surgical masks are single-use items, um, and it is really not a good idea to expect people or ask people to reuse them. Although, no, there's an extreme shortage of PPE, there are companies now, and I've got a list of about three or four suppliers that have them, that are making things like face shields and masks uh, more readily available. Um, so certainly a single-use surgical mask, particularly if it's soiled or wet, or, um, is not appropriate and must not actually be reused. The situation is slightly different depending on how purist you are for N95 respirators, where um, it can only be dedicated to one individual, but that person in principle, if it doesn't get again moist or it doesn't get damaged or it doesn't get soiled, can wear the respirator uh, for prolonged periods of time. Uh, in the case of, of TB, for example, respirators are recommended um, to, that, that they can be used for periods of, of even up to almost a week. Um, in the ideal setting, uh, the respirator should also be used only once. But this is not an ideal world because the manufacturer specifications for all N95 respirators call it a single-use item. So should there be any recourse um, to a court uh, over the issue um, and somebody claims to have been sick, it would be very difficult to prove um, how they got sick and where the respirator came in. Um, the whole pr problem would be that um, it is labeled a single use item and people are reusing it. So surgical masks, please do not reuse um, respirators. Uh, there's guidance on how to reuse it and, um, and we can make that available with pleasure. 
We understand that in the rural environment, it's not possible to have telephonic consultations. But, you know, perhaps the kind of proxies that could happen is that outside of practice in an open area, uh, somebody could, for example, ask triage questions before admitting them into consulting room um, and, uh, and make a risk assessment on, on that kind of basis. Um, this, unless the other panelists have got uh, other advice around this, that's probably the best that I can think of right now. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, I'm going to ask Prof. Lucille uh, Bloomberg the various questions coming through on testing. Um, the, the first one is really around the sensitivity of the PCR test um, and, and also just the gene expert. Um, then the role of antibody uh, testing, serology testing in the return to work um, you know, uh, uh, process. Um, and then there are questions around the samples that you take, whether you should uh, consider both the oral pharyngeal and the nasopharyngeal, or you can, so if you have to do both, or you can choose to do one or the other, and uh, what the significance of, of, of each recommendation will be. There are quite a few, maybe let me give you these ones. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll add a few once you have answered the first few. Okay, so I'm going to start with the, uh, the, the easy one. No serological testing for the acute diagnosis of COVID. The antibody tests, um, we have no idea of the sensitivity. Um, they are likely negative for IgM in the first week of illness. We don't know when they become positive, and we're unsure about cross-reaction with other coronaviruses. So an absolute no, no, no for diagnosis. They may not tell you whether the person is immune or whether they have cleared the virus, so they cannot be used for return to work. There is some consideration for looking them at later on in the epidemic, looking back at the epidemic to see who might have been infected to get a denominator. But currently, they should not be used. In terms of the PCR, it's highly specific for COVID-19. Very occasionally you do get some cross-contamination in the lab, um, but that is, is not common. That's highly sensitive, but it's important to ensure that you have a good specimen. And as I mentioned, if the PCR is negative, you may need to repeat it if, if COVID-19 is still the number one diagnosis. Um, I think just repeat the other questions. I can only manage no, two no, at the time. <laughs> not a problem. Let's talk about a testing a post isolation. So okay. the recommendation for testing. I think in your slides you said there there was no recommendation, but the question is around health workers. So if you've got a health worker who has tested positive and now they want to go back to work, are you still recommending? It would still be the same if it's 14 days, it should be 14 days after mild illness for return to work. A positive PCR um, at 14 days just tells you that there's some RNA. It may not be, a it may not be viable, it does not differentiate. So we're not using PCR for return to work. We certainly are not using serological tests to show the development of um, antibodies. Prof, I'm sure this one is also for you. BCG, very topical at this point. Any insights that you can share with us around the role of BCG in the prevention of infections and also minimizing the severity of COVID-19? I think the jury is still out on that. And I'm going to post a, a very good uh, commentary by Professor Greg Hussey. I'm going to put it on the website. Um, I think the jury is still out on that. Lots of interest. And uh, I'm going to refer you to that. I think it's a, it's a very good uh, commentary. Okay, I don't know, maybe Kim can take this one or you prof around prophylactic medications for COVID. Uh, people have, uh, you know, asked about zinc, uh, vitamin C, um, you know, and the role of any other medication to prevent um, COVID-19. Thanks, Nolotando. So first of all, unfortunately, there's nothing which is going to prevent COVID-19 infection. 
apart from social distancing techniques, not touching your hands and mouth or face, and absolutely washing your hands like crazy all the time. We, we, there has been lots of discussion around the use of vitamin C and zinc in hospitalized patients, not just with COVID-19, with any viral infection. And unfortunately, there's really no data to back up the use of zinc or vitamin C. In small trials, vitamin C given IV does seem to have had some benefits, but in the Citrus Alley trial, which was quite a large multi-center trial in um, septic or critical care patients in ICU, primary endpoints were not met with vitamin C. So it does seem like vitamin C is really something that's not gonna make a huge difference to a COVID-19 patient. Thank you so much. Uh, now coming to Prof. Duse on the use of masks. Um, uh, I think recommendation for the use of cloth masks uh, by the general public. And also there is a question around uh, gloves. Um, so the one question was around uh, why uh, gloves would be useful if hand washing, hand washing is just as, is, is, is as good. Uh, what's the role of gloves? And then also in the absence of you know, the latex gloves, can they use plastic gloves that are used in the food uh, management uh, uh, environment. So <laughs> that's for you, Prof. So just taking the last question, when you've got nothing, use whatever you have available, but that's not really the, the primary recommendation. Um, but just going firstly to, to the use of gloves, and then we'll get to the masks. On removal of gloves, which are extensively soiled, and they're worn because they're an additional layer on the surface of the skin um, uh, that is a protective layer. On removal, there's a lot of contamination of the hands, particularly when people don't know how to remove the gloves properly, which is probably 99% of all healthcare workers. Um, and, and therefore, it's absolutely mandatory that hands are washed after glove removal. Um, it's as simple as that. So certainly the gloves will, will take on the greatest burden of contamination. Um, and, uh, and removal requires hand washing after that. Going to um, masks that are made of cloth, well, uh, the World Health Organization has got some interesting ideas around it. The problem with these masks made of cloth is that you don't really know how many layers of fabric tissue are required, whether it's appropriately breathable, um, whether they're water impermeable, et cetera. Um, there are some countries that, that recommend that all people going out into public spaces should be wearing a mask. Uh, these are, are frequently Asian countries. Um, and if that is what is a requirement in your country, then you need to follow whatever is done. Um, if you do have nothing at all, certainly a mask on a symptomatic patient um, may be actually pretty useful in creating that barrier that we would otherwise create when we cough into flex elbow or into paper tissue, maybe minimizing some of the droplets that are formed um, and, and acting as a barrier in that way. So um, uh, cloth masks are, are controversial. Uh, again, if you've got absolutely nothing, it would be difficult to say that you can't use them. Um, if you have to try and choose a material, try and get a, a thicker breathable material like denim, uh, we also, it's not easy for things to seep through. Um, and, uh, and those are really the basic, uh, the basic advice um, items that I can give you. Thank you so much, Prof. 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 Bloomberg. Um, the, the question was around um, the oropharyngeal versus the nasopharyngeal sample. Yeah. Whether so, you yeah, you will get the best yield if you do both, an oropharyngeal and a pharyngeal swab. There are some challenges at the moment with uh, access to the swabs to do uh, the nasopharyngeal, uh, in which case you would have to do just the, um, uh, oral, the oral swab. They are both put into the same container. And I think what is very important is that you use an appropriate swab. So you can't use one on a wooden stick and you can't use the calcium alginate swab because that might um, uh, inhibit the PCR. Thank you so much, Prof. I think the other question is around prophylactic medication for health workers, um, considering some of the data on chloroquine. Um, yeah, so your thoughts around some of the, of, the, of the medications. I think 
think this is one for Kim. Kim. Thanks, Nolita. And also, yes, there has been the, and a, a big multi-center global trial has started for healthcare workers to start prophylaxis with chloroquine. Um, it is certainly not recommended as a guideline or protocol currently. At the moment, we have absolutely no idea whether chloroquine will work as prophylaxis. It seems tentatively that chloroquine is, has the most promising data in terms of maybe treating patients and perhaps in preventing infection, but we simply do not know. So we hope that we'll get some information when this trial um, has started. I would recommend though that unless you are enrolled in the trial, you do not take the chloroquine uh, to protect yourself because of the potential toxicity and side effects. So chloroquine is not a benign drug. It causes retinal toxicity. It can prolong the QT interval and result in arrhythmias, especially if you're on other medications which are already prolonging potentially your QT interval. It can cause GIT upset, cytopenias, um, hepatitis, seizures. So it's not a benign drug. And at the moment, we don't have enough evidence for us to say, yes, it's something one certainly should be taking. So do watch this space because it's going to get very interesting and we should have information in the next couple of months. I think this one maybe is also for Prof uh, Bloomberg around uh, how long it takes for a person who has been positive to eventually test negative. Um, so it will vary. Uh, in mild disease, they may become negative uh, before the 14 days, but I think we're being conservative and, and taking the full 14 days. Um, some people, if you test them at seven or eight days, they may be negative, but I think as a program, we need to stick to a, a time, and I think 14 days for de-isolation is what we recommend. In patients who have more severe disease, we're in fact recommending 14 days after the uh, symptoms settle. Thank you so much, Prof. There was a comment around the change in PUI and the fact that now there's an online form, which uh, this is just a comment, not a question to say it's not user-friendly. We still have got more questions coming through. Let's just see if there are others that we may not have uh, covered. I think the one is around whether South Africa will be participating in uh, clinical trials for you know, drug therapy. Let me comment, Nolutando. So in the case where there's potentially promising medication, like we've already mentioned chloroquine, uh, one needs to be on a trial to be able to ethically administer these kind of trial drugs or drugs where it has not been registered with the FDA for this particular purpose. So in the case of something where exactly this happens, there's something called a MURI trial. So M-E-U-R-I. And people can register for MURI trials in their own countries to be able to access medication like this, um, to be able to give it in an ethical way. Obviously, it's really important that your patient, and if they don't understand, the patient's family knows and understands that the drug is not registered for the purpose and may do nothing and may actually cause harm because we simply don't know yet that the patients fill in informed consent forms before these drugs are administered. So this goes for any antiviral, which one may consider giving patients, chloroquine, and really any drug that, that one gives um, to patients with COVID-19, because at the moment, standard of care is supportive. So that means oxygen makes the biggest difference, and then sort of antipyretics, analgesics if necessary, and, and not giving too much IV fluids. So yes, we are involved in trials, and South Africa is involved in it, uh, the hospitals have, are involved in these MURI type trials, and one can also get involved with the WHO and get involved um, with their trials as well. Okay, thank you so much. Maybe, yes, Prof? So, Prof, you may be on, you are still on mute. Uh, part of the, we will be enrolling a number of hospital sites in South Africa as part of the global. Um, 
study with five different arms, and this should happen in the next week or two. Thank you, Prof. Prof, this one for you as well. Uh, sure. Do you feel that the lockdown is uh, managing, to, managing to flatten the curve? Um, and what do you think the current uh, backlog is uh, from a testing point of view, considering that we've only done just over 40,000 tests? So there is definitely under testing. There is definitely a backlog, particularly in the public sector. Um, I really can't comment on the lockdown at this stage. I think we need a much better picture of what is happening in uh, a much broader area. We're looking at hospital admissions now. Um, I think, you know, that's an impossible answer um, at the present. We're hopeful, but I think uh, it's early days. And then the last one, um, I think we are running out of time. We received quite a number of questions. So what we'll do if we have not managed to, uh, you know, uh, put your question up uh, to the panel, we will try and make sure that this is covered uh, at, at, a, at a later stage. So this one is asking how soon after exposure to a positive patient can a doctor have a PCR test done on him or herself? So, <laughs> Prof, you are on mute. I'm not very good at the technology. Sorry about that. So that's quite a difficult one. The incubation period can be anything from, you know, three days up to 14 days. So I think the choice of when you should test um, in asymptomatic people, particularly healthcare workers, uh, is, is a difficult one. I think um, one should wait for symptoms um, and the first sign of symptoms one should test. Otherwise, you're going to be doing a lot of testing that doesn't provide you with the best uh, information. I'm not sure if the others would agree with that. Anyone yeah. else? So you need the best time to get a positive PCI is if you test somebody with symptoms. It's really difficult to know if a person is asymptomatic and on say day 10 and trying to avoid being in isolation for 14 days, whether the test is a true negative or whether somebody is still incubating it and that's the reason that the test is negative. So you really do need to be symptomatic to get, be tested and, get a, uh, and to understand the result. Okay, one last comment maybe from Prof. Doucet around um, the airborne component of uh, SARS-CoV-2. You are on mute, Prof. Pardon? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, let's try and remove the word airborne because I think it is a bit misleading. So we've all seen papers that suggest that uh, certainly through mechanical aerosolization um, and generation of, of cough-like issues, the virus is present in air and it can stay in the air for various periods of time. Um, the looking at factors like series intervals and reproduction numbers, um, if COVID um, were truly an airborne pathogen as a predominant route of transmission, uh, we would be seeing a very, very different picture with the epidemic curve and the numbers. Um, it is typically a virus that really relates and, and matches well, uh, droplet and contact transmission. Um, and those are the two main areas of transmission that we need to consider and really worry about. So most of the efforts need to be around these two areas. When people mechanically um, create aerosols, for example, when procedures are done, it is during mechanical aerosolization that the organisms can remain in large numbers around the patient for, for certain periods of time. And it is for this reason that we say that if anybody is performing an aerosol generating procedure, um, and that includes everything from intubation to induction, et cetera, it is important for them to actually possibly consider a higher grade of protection of the respiratory um, uh, mucosa and the mouth by using an N95 respirator. Thank you so much, Prof. I think we have come uh, towards the end of the session. We've got a poll where people can actually, um, you know, indicate if they found the session uh, useful. This is very helpful for us in planning future sessions and also how we can improve. Please be very
very mindful that obviously this is a challenging time for all of us using these tools. Uh, I think they're still very meaningful in uh, reaching out and making sure that we disseminate this very meaningful uh, information. But uh, at some points, we may find some technical glitches here and there. But I think overall, I think it's a very meaningful platform. We are also running a podcast. Uh, we've got one uh, already recorded uh, with Prof. Uh, Guy Richards. And I think it's important uh, that you do give us this feedback uh, using the poll. And I'd like to really thank our, our presenters today, our experts today for taking time out of their very, very busy schedules to come and share this information with you. And I think uh, we know that there's a lot that is still unknown with COVID-19. We, we, we are hoping that we are going to have more sessions like this where we can update you, um, you know, uh, on, on ongoing updates on what is going on, you know, as we get uh, more data being published to ensure that, um, you know, as you manage your patients and look after yourselves in the, you know, as frontline uh, providers of care, you are aware of what the latest information is. We really thank you for, for participating. We would like you to really participate here in the poll just to give us the feedback. And we would like to make sure that you use some of the resources like the NICD website, the Department of Health website. You can also use, a, you can visit our discovery website where you can come to our content hub where we have also tried to, um, to put uh, some of these uh, tools and resources together for you. Um, yeah, I don't know if there is anything else that I might have missed out on, but we really thank you. We, we had a very good attendance and um, will appreciate every feedback that we get. Um, once again, I'd like to thank Prof. Lucille Bloomberg, Prof. Busey, uh, Dr. Kim Robeck, and uh, Dr. Linda Erasmus for really uh, sharing uh, all these insightful, um, you know, uh, presentations with us. We thank you and good night. <laughs>